For most of the dinosaur era, fast, vicious, deadly, flesh-eating predators were no larger than tigers. Then came a fiendish new strategy for survival. Dinosaurs began to grow, some as big as a building. Huge, monstrous, and overpowering, they would become known as the Great Carnosaurs. of Alberta, Canada are thousands of square miles of nothing but scrub, brush, and sand. Yet this place is a gold mine for paleontologists. The landscape is riddled with fossils, including those of the most terrible land animals that ever lived. Here, more than 500 dinosaur skeletons have been discovered. 75 million years ago, this was a coastal plain close to the sea and lush with plant life. For most of the dinosaur era, which began 245 million years ago, predators remained no larger than today's land animals. The forces that would eventually drive evolution had yet to emerge. The continents were knitted together into a single landmass called Pangaea. The climate was warm and dry. Dinosaurs roamed freely. Then, 200 million years ago, Pangaea broke apart. isolating dinosaur populations and creating a revolution in their development. Some plant-eating dinosaurs grew enormous. To survive, the dinosaurs that preyed on them had to grow too. as much as 30 times larger. And they perfected their arsenal of weapons. These were the conosaurs, the general name given to large meat-eating dinosaurs. At least 15 feet long, they walked upright on two legs, had large heads, dagger-like teeth, and very short arms. These are the killer dinosaurs every child loves and the mainstay of old science fiction movies. Modern reconstructions draw thousands to theme parks. Their bodies as big as buildings. Their steps made the earth tremble as they chased their prey and tore it apart with their powerful jaws. Some of the first examples of connoisseurs were found in Alberta's badlands. Embedded in stone, dead for at least 75 million years. Albertosaurus is a member of the most highly evolved, the most fearsome, and deadly connoisseur family of them all, 
the Tyrannosaurus. Its killer cousin is perhaps the best known dinosaur of them all, Tyrannosaurus rex. Here in Dinosaur Provincial Park, Phil Curry and his team from Canada's Royal Tyrell Museum have just uncovered the remains of a killer. This quarry was only opened three days ago, but enough has been exposed already that we can identify what kind of dinosaur it is. If we look at this rib, for example, we can see the head. Uh, in front of the rib are a number of very slender bones, which are called gastralia, and, and gastralia are special bones that cover the belly region of tyrannosaur dinosaurs. And from the size of these gastralia and the shape, we can tell that this is a tyrannosaurid. This is a vertebra from the trunk region. And just being uncovered right now are a series of vertebrae from the neck. And again, these confirm that this is a tyrannosaurid. We think at this point in time that this is probably a half-grown Albertosaurus. Curry and his team are covering Albertosaurus with a plaster cast so it can be transported safely back to the lab for examination. Like all carnosaurs, Albertosaurus used its massive head as a weapon. Its jaw was longer and its teeth bigger than earlier predatory dinosaurs. This extra equipment would have made the skull heavy, but nature is ingenious. The skull acquired holes and its bones were hollow but critical stress points within the skull were heavily reinforced. Albertosaurus was the size of a small bus and weighed two and a half tons. It had a thin build with a pointed snout and a severe overbite. Paleontologists used to think carnosaurs were slow, lumbering creatures, just overgrown alligators and crocodiles. Some suggest they were even too big to hunt and depended instead on scavenging. Curry believes that based on the footprints of smaller predatory dinosaurs with similar leg structures, carnosaurs were in fact swift and agile. For example, uh, an ornithomimid, um, one of the fastest dinosaurs known, when it was walking would take fairly short steps. But as it moved faster, those steps would increase greatly. And by measuring the distance between two left footprints or two right footprints uh, and the length of the foot itself, we can calculate how fast those animals were moving. From his studies of ancient footprints left in mud, Curry estimated the six foot tall dinosaur moved about 15 miles an hour. When it wasn't hampered by mud, it could probably run much faster. Albertosaurus and the other connoisseurs were probably not as fast, though most paleontologists agree they could outrun a human. Some estimate they could move up to 40 miles an hour. Just in speed and size alone, these were terrifying creatures, but it was their arsenal of killing tools, including their jaws and powerful necks, that inspires awe. Most think of dinosaurs as giant creatures, but many were quite small. It wasn't until the end of the Cretaceous era, 65 million years ago, that the giants truly emerged. Their rise to dominance was destined 200 million years ago, when the supercontinent of Pangaea broke in two. The newly forming mountain ranges and inland seaways isolated the dinosaurs into smaller and smaller groups. This geographic isolation is the primary event that makes evolution work. It allows for greater diversity. As the land masses drifted apart, both plants and animals began adapting to their new environments by evolving a variety of strategies for survival. Among the plant eaters, ankylosaurs developed heavy armor and a club tail. Triceratops evolved shields and enormous horns. And the Seismosaurus simply grew huge, as big as five elephants the largest animal ever to walk the earth. In the game of survival, size proved to be a successful strategy. But when sheer size wasn't enough, some plant eaters found safety in numbers. They formed herds for additional protection. 
To keep up with their prey, meat-eating dinosaurs grew larger as well. But size wasn't enough. To maintain their advantage, they had to be smarter and faster. If they weren't, they would starve. We know that uh, whenever there's a major change from one group of animals into another group of animals, it usually happens in the meat-eating animals, not in, in the plant-eating animals. And there's a lot of reasons for this. But generally, we find that within a group, there is an influence between the meat-eaters and the plant-eaters. The plant-eaters are trying to get bigger and better arms so that they can protect themselves better against the meat-eaters, but the meat-eaters have to stay ahead in that arms race. They always have to be a little bit more intelligent, a little bit more faster, because if they're not, they won't eat. The basic strategies of carnosaurs and their plant-eating prey were similar throughout the world. But in geographic isolation, curious physical changes were in store. One place to investigate these changes is Argentina. Here, new and unusual connoisseurs are being found. In the past, most dinosaur fossils were unearthed in the northern hemisphere where paleontology originated and fossils were easily located. Because of the long period of isolation between the two supercontinents, when a new dinosaur is discovered in South America, it often has novel features. Jose Bonaparte of Argentina's National Museum of Natural Science in Buenos Aires has been called the master of the Mesozoic. He has studied dinosaurs in Argentina for three decades, longer than anyone else. In 1985, Dr. Bonaparte discovered a one-ton meat-eating dinosaur called Carnotaurus. His find surprised paleontologists. Conotaurus appeared shortly after the continent split apart. The skull was very tall for its length and strongly built. But its most unusual feature is the two large flat horns jutting out over its eyes. Conosaurs usually have very small horns, if any at all. This skull, as you say, is very unusual for a carnivorous dinosaur because it is provided with very large horns. We understand that this horn helps the animal for killing the prey because um, the forearms of this animal are very much reduced. The back of the skull was designed to anchor powerful neck and jaw muscles, the hallmark of carnosaurs. While many of the early predators killed by slashing with claws on their feet, the carnosaurs developed huge sledgehammer heads and jaws so powerful they could easily rip through bone and armor plate. The mouths of many carnosaurs had a special hinge that allowed them to open wider. Conotaurus had a hinge that enabled it to widen its mouth sideways as well. was adapted for taking especially large bites, as large as 100 pounds a mouthful. This articulation enabled the animal to widen the mouth, to make this movement. And this movement um, helped for swallowing big pieces of meat, because the animal was able to widen the lower jaw in this part, that is the place for the swallowing of the, of the piece. Conotaurus puzzle scientists. Despite its huge jaw muscles, its lower jaw is half that of a T-Rex of similar size, and its teeth are more slender. Also, Conotaurus is significantly smaller than the giants that evolved later, such as Allosaurus, Spinosaurus, and T-Rex. And yet, Conotaurus is the largest predator ever found in South America and clearly the dominant animal. 
its slender lower jaw may not have mattered. It could kill and eat anything it wanted, and it had no enemies. The connoisseurs that came after would further perfect body structures to become truly remarkable killing machines. As paleontologists expand their southward search for fossils, they are discovering connoisseurs that are strikingly different from those previously known. One of the oldest giant connoisseurs was found here, just 400 miles from the South Pole. In 1991, a geologist working in the area discovered a fragment of bone, luring paleontologists to the frozen wasteland to investigate. During the dig, the temperature never rose above 25 degrees below zero. Diggers moved 5,000 pounds of rock to free their amazing find. Grylophosaurus, the frozen crested dinosaur, was a 25-foot long flesh eater. It is the first dinosaur to be unearthed in Antarctica. At 190 million years, it is also one of the oldest connoisseurs ever discovered. Paleontologist William Hammer of Augustana College in Illinois led the dig. So this is the eye. This is the top of the head right here. And these are ridges, long narrow ridges that run along the top of the head from, the, from where the nose would be back to above the eye. And then these ridges merge in the middle and form a, a very large crest. And uh, this is the most unique thing about the skull, this, this crest. Its crest was most likely used for display purposes during courtship, like a peacock's tail. Although other connoisseurs had some type of headgear, Gralophosaurus's was significantly larger and too fragile for fighting. When Hammer began to separate it from the rock, he and his team made another discovery. They had found not one dinosaur, but two. It seems Crylophosaurus was devouring a large plant-eating dinosaur called a prosauropod when it died. Well, it seems that this animal was uh, eating another one when it died. In fact, it might have even choked on the ribs of, of a plant eater. There are two ribs from another plant-eating uh, prosauropod here in the mouth. They start here behind. Uh, in the back of the skull, you can see them going right down all the way into the mouth between the jaws here. This is the back end of the skull, right, right below where the vertebral column or the, the backbone would attach. And you can see two ribs going down, and you can follow them all the way down into the mouth right between the jaws. And these are the lower jaws here, and this was uh, broken off. It would extend all the way out had we the rest of the skull. With the discovery of the Crylophosaurus, science can now trace the evolution of the Connoisseur back almost 200 million years to the Jurassic period. The reduced arms, sledgehammer head, and steel trap jaws would continue to be refined over 135 million years until an animal would evolve whose every feature down to the core of its bones was created solely for killing. As the large connoisseurs, such as T-Rex, became more efficient at the end of the Cretaceous, they forced out all other predators. They became the sole large flesh eaters. Phil Curry believes these evolutionary changes were beginning to snowball. But towards the end, during the Cretaceous, we're seeing an acceleration in diversification and greater and greater changes taking place. So it appears that uh, things were evolving very slowly initially, but towards the end of their reign on the earth as, as the king dinosaurs or the, the, the top carnivores, they were diversifying much more rapidly and changing much more rapidly. Whether hunting alone or in groups, carnosaurs were deadly. 
They would rush in at tremendous speed, scoop out a huge hunk of flesh, then leap back and wait for their prey to bleed to death. Risk-free and very effective. Based on the habits of modern predators, the connoisseurs probably hunted at dawn or dusk or on moonlit nights. They may have only eaten once a week or even every other week, but when they ate, it might have been 1,000 pounds at a sitting. In North America, Albertosaurus and Tyrannosaurus took two evolutionary courses. Tyrannosaurus took the fast track and became larger and stronger. Albertosaurus remained the same size. It was quicker than T-Rex, but not as big. As carnosaurs evolved their fast, long legs and large meat-scooping jaws, all else was pared away. Their arms and shoulders grew smaller, no bigger than a man's. The reason they developed the short arms is to reduce the amount of weight in front of the hips. As you get bigger, you end up having more mass in front of the hips, and if you're uh, a big meat-eating dinosaur, you suffer the um, possibility that you're gonna fall on your face if you have too much weight up front. So what these animals did was reduce the weight as much as possible. Regardless of the fact that they're very short arms, they are nevertheless quite powerful, and one would assume that these animals were in fact grasping their prey, holding on to them while the jaws did their dirty work. We know how connoisseurs were built, but what did they really look like? Some speculate they had lizard-like skin. Others suggest they were more like birds and perhaps even had feathers. Now Jose Bonaparte has found the first direct evidence, a skin impression from a connoisseur. This is interesting because some paleontologists suppose that the carnivorous dinosaur they had some feathers, but we have discovered not the slight indication of feather in the skin impression. Reconstructing the shape of a dinosaur's head is fairly easy. The heads were mostly skin and bones, so the shape closely matches that of the skull. The body is more difficult. The skeleton is a clue to its size and bulk. Probably the most difficult question is what color were they? The small predators were probably camouflaged with stripes and spots. But camouflage wouldn't make much difference to a 20-foot tall killer, so the biggest connoisseurs were most likely a dull green or gray. Based on the size of their brain case, the last of the connoisseurs had added a new feature to their already impressive arsenal of weapons, intelligence. It is a characteristic of all pack hunting animals. I think that uh, you need a relatively high degree of intelligence to um, work as a coordinated group, um, as a packing animal. And it's not surprising that most of the most intelligent animals today uh, are in fact some of the more intelligent animals that we're aware of. So it's not surprising that amongst the dinosaurs, the ones that we think are packing animals are the ones with the largest brains. The later carnosaur's eyes look forward, giving them depth perception, thus allowing them to strike more accurately. And they had a highly directional sense of hearing. At the time of the great dinosaur extinction, 65 million years ago, Great connoisseurs were rapidly diversifying and becoming increasingly sophisticated. The pattern for two-legged dinosaurs with big heads and sharp teeth started early in the dinosaur era and carried through until they had become the most terrifying and deadly animals ever to walk the earth. It's a good thing for humans that they went extinct, otherwise mammals, including ourselves, might never have evolved. Yet one wonders, how much further could the connoisseurs have progressed? What deadly new adaptations might they have evolved? Could they have become any more frightening?